So the talks for the first session is on the solar system and asteroid magnetism, which is um, the first ones by James Bryson from Oxford on a revised intensity of the protoplanetary disk magnetic field from the Winchcombe meteorite. So I'm going to hand it over to you. And then uh, 15 minutes, and then I'll stand up when one minute's left. Cool, thank you. Um, first things first, thank you to everyone in Cambridge who's put in all the work and um, effort into organizing the meeting. <coughs> Fingers crossed it all runs through. <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, for those of you who saw my, my magnets talk a few months ago, I'm going to be talking about something I could say very similar. I'm going to be talking about exactly the same thing. But I always thought it's nice to do it in person because we can interact more this way. Uh, and I want to be talking, I'm going to be talking today about the magnetic field that we've recovered from this meteorite. Is there a point, Rich? Uh, no, can you use the, uh, use the thing on the, the map? Because oh. then people remain to see that. This meteorite, uh, which is Winchcombe. It fell uh, just north of Oxford in, in the Cotswolds uh, on the 28th of February, 2021. Um, and within 12 hours, uh, the family whose driveway had fallen on had picked it up. Uh, and we were there to characterize it. And we put it together a consortium led by early career researchers across the UK to analyze this. And I'm one of those five early re career researchers who's leading this. And the first paper came out in Science Advances right at the end of last year. We've had two subsequent papers come out of the last week or two. And the paper on the magnetism is just going through the review process. But the main reason that we're interested in studying this is that within just a few million years of the ignition of our sun, our solar system underwent profound transformation from this vast protoplanetary disk of dust and gas into just uh, a few organized orbiting planetary bodies. What I'm showing on the left here is an actual telescope image of one of these taken a few years ago using the Albert telescope that's really transformed their understanding of how these disks behave. And the processes involved in these disks fundamentally dictate the properties and behavior of each planet that falls. So we can just look at the variety of planets we see throughout our galaxy in the form of exoplanets to see that this process can generate an entire plethora of planetary behaviors. And as far as we understand it, as far as we're able to tell, only very rarely does that lead to a planet that's conducive to life. So what was happening in our protoplanetary testament, we had one planet that ended up fostering life. And there's lots of things that govern the transformation of these disks into planets, and one of them is this vast magnetic field that threads the entire protoplanetary disk. Uh, this protoplanetary disk is made of dust and gas, and that's ionized by both solar radiation and cosmic rays, and it's moving around. So similar to a dynamo, it generates this huge magnetic field. Now, just based on some very sort of fundamental bits of physics to do with how these disks behave, their temperature, their density, their size, sort of very basic properties like that, we can predict using what are effectively glorified back in the envelope calculations, the kind of intensities these fields must have had. Now, there's lots of different models that sort of put different weights on different aspects of these fundamental physics, but they all have three properties in common. Firstly, they all vary by orders of magnitude with distance away from the star. So here I'm showing distance in radius in astronomical units where one AU is a distance from the sun to the earth at the present day. So they vary by orders of magnitude. They're always strongest nearest the star, and that's just because the density of dust and gas is higher near the star. And between where Earth is today and where Jupiter is today, we're talking about Earth's strength field, so, so tens of micrometers. There. And again, regardless of the model, there's a, a few references up here, they all have this broad, these three features uh, in common. As I said, these are based on some very fundamental bits of physics, but we've shown using ALMA that these disks are not as uniform and straightforward as that fundamental physics would predict. They have these rich rings and inhomogeneities in them. Um, so that texture is not recorded in this magnetic field profile. What we might expect instead is something like this. Now, this is just a hypothetical example that I made just by adding some peaks to that curve. But you can see that where we have variations in density or pressure inside that disk, we might expect there to be variations in the magnetic field strength as well. So where we have a higher density of dust and gas, that sucks in the magnetic flux. So we probably have something much more like this. And what's really exciting when you talk to the, the astrophysicists is that these pressure maxima, these non-uniformities, they have been proposed to be the entire catalyst for the process of planet building. 
There have been a whole bunch of models of planet building that have spun out of these telescope images, and they all work assuming that something happens in the disk that can densify material. Once you've densified it, then one process starts building meter-sized objects, then one kilometer-sized objects, and then planet-sized objects. You've got to get going at the start. And it's been these non-uniformities, these pressure maxima, that have been proposed to the entire foundation for this process. And what we can do with magnetism is start to say, right, if the magnetic field reflects these pressure maxima, we can use the magnetism recorded in meteorites to say, where were they? What intensity did they have? Therefore, what density did they have? Was that enough to kickstart the entire process of planet building? So we can use magnetism as that tool for probing these key inhomogeneities throughout protoplanetary disks. And the one thing that we can do as sort of the, the Earth scientists and, and the, the lab-based people is say, we can actually take the rocks that date from that period and look at their magnetism to inform us as to what our protoplanetary disk was doing. So what I'm showing here is a compilation of paleo intensities we've recorded from a whole bunch of different chondrites. These are all carbonaceous chondrites. I mean, we think they come from the same broad region of the disk uh, as a function of their time recovered from major metric dating. So we've got paleo intensity on the y-axis and, and, and time on the x-axis after solar system formation. And if we take this at face value, uh, it's a mess. We're seeing variations by over two orders of magnitude. Um, and we can come up with models of our disk, albeit admittedly very contrived, that do go up and down very quickly in magnetic field. But um, we, we have to do a lot, push models to their limit to actually get this, to reproduce this. Um, in an effort to try and clarify things, we as a community have arguably made things a little more complicated. Um, but what I want to do today is talk about this group here, the CM chondrites. Uh, and that's largely because Winchcombe is one of these meteorites. Here it is. This is the bit that was picked up from the driveway in, in the Cotswolds where it landed um, within a few hours. Uh, and we've been characterizing it. And to leading order, it looks just like any other uh, heavily aqueously altered carbonaceous chondrite. So it's full of phyllosilicates that form through the reaction of and hydrosilicates with water, to chilonite, which is just hydroxy oxy sulfide that you really only find in this meteorite group. And then from the magnetic minerals, we have magnetite and we have iron sulfides, uh, predominantly pyrotite. And then there's a little bit of calcite and then some of these remnant anhydrous silicates. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of this sort of uh, phyllosilicate in green uh, and red with uh, iron and magnesium and then blue with the calcites. When we look in a little bit more detail, we can start to see the magnetic phases um, and Winchcombe has got uh, a fair amount of, of magnetite. Um, it forms through a sort of quite atypical mechanism, but we had an original troilite grain, stoichiometric iron sulfide, that is uh, dissolved through uh, interaction with water, and then the magnetite reprecipitates in that space. So this isn't the clearest example, but you can see sort of the outline of a hexagonal sulfide grain that used to exist here. That's atypical in a CM chondrite. Most of them, uh, undergo this reaction I'm showing down here, where you've got a large metal grain and it reacts with water and it is a pseudomorphic replacement where magnetite replaces that metal uh, just through this reaction here. So immediately just from looking down the microscope, which comes a little bit unique in its form of its magnetite and how they form. And I'll be referring to these as framboids and then these plaquettes, which are a little unclear there. They're stacked plates of magnetite like that. Um, and so we think, Magnetite and pyrotite form through uh, aqueous alteration of metal and troilite, and this happens at low temperature. So we'd expect these meteorites to carry a CRM, and if that occurred within the lifetime of the magnetic field supported by the disk, it'd be a CRM of that disk field. Uh, and this is the case for most low temperature carbonation chondrites. I'll be referring to these later on the talk, so I still include it here, but it's pretty much the case for all CM chondrites. And just before I start talking about winter, specifically, I want to talk about the paleomagnetic results we've had from other CM chondrites. So here I'm showing an orthogonal projection plot of, of a CM chondrite that's been AF demagnetized. We see we have a low coercivity component shown by the blue arrow, followed by a high coercivity component shown by the red arrow. And we get to 100 um, millitesla here, and it's still not at the origin. It's still got a particularly uh, hard magnetic component in there. But when we do a thermal demag of the NRM, we can see we're mostly lost by sort of 250 to 300 degrees C. So it looks both from the high coercivity over here and the Curie temperature over here, that this remnant is carried almost solely by, by pyrotite. Um, and there's not really much carried by magnetite in here. And I'll, I'll come back to that at the end of the talk, but it looks like it's mostly pyrotite. 
Uh, and when we do a paleo intensity determination, it's, it's four plus or minus three microtesla. So about an order of magnitude weaker than what we see on Earth as well. So a particularly weak magnetic field. So moving on to Winchcombe, the paper that's under review, uh, we immediately see something very different. We, these are orthogonal projection plots of three subsamples that I measured, and we're seeing much more pronounced low coercivity, medium coercivity components, some of them with very abrupt changes in direction. Um, and then we're seeing high coercivity components that are mostly demagnetized, sitting on the origin by 80 or 85 millitesla. So it looks like we have a predominant magnetic mineralogy in Winchcombe that's got a softer magnetization, and we are removing the vast majority of it, and we're seeing much more pronounced low coercivity and medium coercivity components and variations in direction of those as well. But it does look like we have some nice origin trending high coercivity components in there that do extend up to quite high AF values of sort of 80 millitesla, but not admittedly as high as most of the CM chondrites. I'm closing up the projections here uh, of the low coercivity component on the left, the medium in the middle, and the high on the right. When we look at the low coercivity component, the points in red here are the fusion crust. So this is a bit of the meteorite that got melted as it came in through the atmosphere. When you see movies of rockets coming through the atmosphere and meteorites when they have their fireball, they do melt the outside. Uh, so this is effectively a baked contact test. We know the direction of Earth's field when Winchcombe landed, and we can start to look at the different components within the meteorite uh, in the interior that wasn't heated to say, are we recording Earth's field? So over here, we have our Earth direction in red and our low coercivity component of Winchcombe uh, over here. And we're not, it's not in the same direction, um, but we are seeing sort of a, admittedly quite wide, but, but uniform direction pointing over here. In the medium coercivity, you have a much more defined um, uh, terrestrial direction. And then there's a, a sort of an arc of directions going away from that uh, as we move to the baked samples and then the interior samples ending over here. And then we look at the high coefficient component. All of our interior samples are in the same direction as where this arc over here ends, suggesting that the interior is uniformly magnetized in this direction uh, and the fusion crust, the terrestrial field is pointing over in this direction. So we're seeing near antipodal terrestrial and pre-terrestrial components, which gives us a lot of confidence that this is definitely not a terrestrial contamination down here. We're seeing in the interior of the sample. So again, that terrestrial component is probably a viscous remnant magnetization from which comes sitting uh, in Earth's field. It was experiencing Earth's field for several months before we measured it. Uh, the medium coercivity is actually uh, a mixture between the two because we've AFD magnetized it. It can be difficult to resolve those two components. And the high coercivity looks like this primary pre-terrestrial remnants. We've done some paleo intensity determinations using ARM. I tried doing these before using thermal and it's an absolute nightmare and it doesn't produce anything useful, so I didn't do it. Um, but we're seeing um, nice uh, resolvable paleo intensities that range from about 10 to about 21 microtesla, depending on the sample or the subsample that we're looking at. And just to present, uh, these are the seven subsamples that produced high quality metrics in our paleo intensity determination. Um, and we're getting an average of about 15 and a half microtesla plus or minus eight and a half or so. Now in reality, not reality, sorry, what was actually happening was the parent body, the parent asteroid of this meteorite was spinning. And if it's experiencing the magnetic field from the protoplanetary disk, if it's spinning, you end up recording a projection of the disk field onto the spin axis. And on average, that will reduce the intensity we determined by a factor of two. So we have to double our paleo intensity uh, recovery value. So we say that Winchcombe, uh, recovered an average pain intensity of about 31 plus or minus 17 microtesla. Uh, and just looking back at those framboids of magnetite, um, they're at this really nice size range, about 200, 1 to 200 nanometers, uh, where Les showed a few years ago that they have relaxation times on the order of greater than 10 to the 15 years. So we think that these things recorded uh, a magnetic field in the early solar system, and that's been retained ever since. They're almost in that perfect sweet spot being particularly stable in their vortex domain state. So, I, in an effort to try and make things a little bit more clear, have come along and found that Winchcombe is different to the CM contracts and sort of plots up here. So I've made things even worse. I have made, tried to simplify a story, I've actually got another data point that doesn't agree with what we've got from anywhere else before. But in an effort to try and reconcile things and, and move things forward and be as um, informative as I can, I have come up with a model that tries to reconcile this. And I think one of the most important things to think about is what's actually carrying the magnetization in each of these. So we've got metal in the CO chondrules, metal in the, the IMD CV chondrite, um, metal in the CR chondrites, chondrules, sorry. And then we've got framboid magnetite 
regular magnetite and pyrotite and winchcomb. And then in the CM conjugate, it's magnetite and pyrotite. And then these two, they've got very weak magnetizations of purely magnetite. So what we can see is when we look at the magnetic carrier, we're seeing different pairing densities. The metals are the highest, framboid magnetite is higher again, and then the magnetite are the lowest with a pyrotite component being slightly higher. So what we can say is in a typical CM chondrite and in which can we had this pre-alteration minerality. We had metal that uh, is magnetized in lots of different directions because of the way that this thing accretes. Um, and then we have troilite, this FES, which is non-magnetic, same in Winchcombe. And then when we alter this, it looks like, based on what we see in the experiments, that the magnetize, magnetite is not becoming magnetized in the CM chondrites, regular ones, but the pyrotite is. That's what uh, the group in Suresh showed a few years ago. And what we've seen in Winchcombe is that we've got the stronger pain intensity and we're forming framboidal magnetite, which forms through a fundamentally different process. And we just consider this, that it might become magnetized. So the regular magnetite, the pseudomorphic replacement, does not become magnetized, whereas the framboid magnetite does become magnetized. When we then apply an ARM, we necessarily magnetize everything because that's what we do when we apply an ARM. We can't apply it to only one type of grain. And that magnetizes everything, magnetite, pyrotite, and framboid and magnetite. So what that means is when we do our NRM demagnetization for a typical CM chondrite, we're only removing a small component. But when we do the ARM, we're removing the pyrotite and magnetite. And that will mean we have a very shallow slope in our paleo intensity determination because we're only demagnetizing a portion of the carriers. In Winchcombe, we're still demagnetizing a portion, a larger portion, because of pyrotite and framboid or magnetite. But again, it's not going to give us the, the, the slope we would expect in either of these cases, although this one would be closer. What we can do is just based on some of the abundance of the different phases uh, and um, the, uh, their, their magnetic their susceptibilities effectively, how easy the different magnetized pyrotypes are to magnetize, we can calculate what the intensity would be for different fractions of framboid magnetite. And we can determine these using fork diagrams, which I didn't have time to go into today, but the paper came out in last uh, 2021 now. Uh, and we can say that for the measured amount of framboid magnetite we see in these meteorites, uh, it overlaps what we would calculate in our paleo intensity we recover from Winchcombe almost perfectly. So if we had a mineralogy that could record the entire, that the entire mineralogy could record the magnetization, we would get out the value we have up here, which is about 77 microtesla. So what Collectively, Winchcombe and the other CM contracts are arguing is that the field inside our proprietary disk was actually fairly strong. And if we only have magnetite or, or and, and no pyrotite, um, we actually would end up with a much weaker magnetization. And that's what we're seeing in the CM contracts and some of the other contracts as well. So we had our original picture over here. And if we apply that, that um, solution to it, we can discount some entirely because they just don't have a minerality that can record a magnetization. We can correct the CM chondrites up to this 77 value. And in fact, what we're seeing is a lot of the meteorites imply the ones that remain that we did have quite a strong and quite stable magnetic field. Uh, and we can actually simplify this picture by thinking about the mineralogy of what's happening inside each of these meteorites. And just to finish things off, I've just taken the average value we get from a carbonaceous chondrite in blue here. Then this is the value the disk field will recover from non-carbonaceous chondrites in red. And within our community, we say that these ones are dry, so they come from closer to the sun, and these ones are, are wet, so they come from further away. And what we can see is that disagrees with this prediction of the magnetic field's intensity as a function of distance. So we had this nice, for uniform disk, decreasing magnetic field, and that's not what we're seeing. So one way of reconciling this is simply to say, we might have had a pressure maximum at some point in our disk, and that was concentrating magnetic flux and producing this value we see up here. So this is the first sort of tentative suggestion that we might be seeing uh, direct evidence of a pressure maximum in our disk around where this combination contracts were forming, and could, we can now link that to potential models of planet building. I have massively run out of time. So I'm just gonna quickly pop up my, um, my um, conclusions here, but just to say, We've got a strong magnetic field in which come stronger than those most CMs, and we've tried to come up with a model that can reconcile that. And if it is reconcilable, it, it suggests we might have had a heterogeneity in our disk, which could be one of the first robust identifications of a, of a catalyst for planet building. Thank you. People have questions. There's one question online. Hey, so fantastic talk. I, I just, I, I just love this work it's really uh, uh, 
fascinating stuff. So I, I really a, a really boring question, really. It's about the the transformation of the different mineralogies. So you have iron sulfides, so a troilite you said you had, and some pyrotite and then magnetite. So how do you know the transformation is from trilite to magnetite and not pyrotite to magnetite? Because there's obviously it can be quite a fundamentally different type of uh, interaction during the, the dissolution that happens in the two different methods. Good question. So when we look at meteorites that cover the entire spectrum of degree of aqueous alteration, the least altered all have troilite, and then they become more pyrotite rich, they become more altered. Uh, and we can also look at the protrology to say that that transformation of sulfide to magnetite in this meteorite had to occur comparatively early on in the process. So it could have gone troilite, pyrotite, magnetite, but that would have to have happened quickly. Um, it just is a little bit more palatable because it has to happen so quickly for it to be just troilite that becomes dissolved and then reprecipitation. We also know that in these meteorites, something is different in the aqueous chemistry or the aqueous conditions that mean that instead of going troilite to pyrotite, we are dissolving the troilite entirely and reprecipitating the magnetite in that void that's left behind. So it could be troilite, pyrotite, dissolution, reprecipitation. But I think the important thing is that it involves a dissolution of reprecipitation. It's not a pseudomorphic replacement where there's a parent property, be it magnetization or anything else that could be inherited. We are dissolving reprecipitating. So I don't think it really matters if it goes troilite, pyrotite, dissolution, or troilite dissolution. We okay, that's, yeah. Together. That, that, uh, so that answers my second question, because when you're looking at the, the magnetite framboids, they don't look as a classical framboidal as you might see in, say, a gregite or something. No, you're but, right. First. Um, we have, we, uh, uh, admittedly, this is not the neatest example there. The first paper uh, that present these came out literally a week ago. Uh, I can send you a link. We have neater examples of framboids and the ones I showed. But you're right, they are not. They're not your really pretty magnetite framboids using in some kind right, or the gregite framboids we see more predominantly in terrestrial science. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I don't want to take all the time left. That's, that's really great. Thanks, James. Thank you. Um, yeah, great talk, James. Um, so, quite an elementary question, but the A intensities, so are we using some sort of calibration factor between A on and CRO? Yep, we're using, um, uh, because it's predominantly carried by magnetite, we think, we're using uh, uh, the coloration factor of 3.33, which is the average that lots of people have got from lab experiments across a whole bunch of different groups uh, for that TRM to ARM conversion. We're assuming, yeah. well, the ARM to recover a TRM value, we're using a factor of 3.33, for the yeah. CRM to yeah. TRM, we're yeah. assuming one to one. Because it's a comparatively slow process and slow processes tend to link to that. Um, I know there's a whole bunch of people in the room who have been working on that number. Um, meteorites don't fall in our doorstep every day. Um, and I'd love to have done this all three or four years down the line when we had a better value for that. Um, but that value can be quite reaction specific as well. Um, uh, I think what's nice is we can say the period of in Winchcombe is relative compared to most of the ends and automatically stronger. I think that's true. Um, and we also know that only the pyrotype can magnetize the regular CM, not the magnetite. Um, and regardless of the specifics, this must still be happening in a regular CM. We are still magnetizing everything in the ARM. We're still only seeing a fr fraction of that in the NRM. So some element of this model I propose must be happening. Um, but you're right, in terms of the quantitative approach, in three or four years, hopefully we can we can get a, a more precise number. Thanks. We don't really have time for more questions, so if you have more questions, you can probably ask James and coffee. Thank you.